Welcome all of you to this live program on authority principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Manuel Ribeiro from Porto, Portugal. Dr. Manuel Ribeiro de Silva is an orthopedic surgeon at the Hospital of Porto in Portugal, where he's in charge of the shoulder and elbow unit. He finished his residency at the Central Hospital at Porto in Portugal in 2013 and performed his fellowships in Paris and Lyon in France. He has special interest in shoulder and elbow pathology, sports medicine, and trauma. Additionally, in 2019, he finished his PhD in orthopedics at the University of Porto in Portugal, and also a post-graduation in sports medicine at the University of Porto, and a post-graduation in healthcare management at the Catholic University of Portugal in 2018. He's a researcher at the I3S a Research Institute attached to the University of Porto, and also an invited teacher at the University of Portugal. So today is my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Manuel Ribeiro de Silva from Porto Portugal. Over to Manuel. Thank you, Professor Gopalan. It is a great honor for me to be here with you. And so over the next uh, 30 minutes or something, we are. I am going to speak to you about proximal biceps tendon pathologies. So wait, because my keyboard is not working yet. So my talking points will be regarding anatomy, the function, the pathology, the diagnosis, both clinical and magiological, the treatment, both non-operative, but especially the operative treatment. So regarding the proximal biceps, the long, of, long head of the biceps has its proximal origin in the supraglenoid tubercle in the uh, scapula, together with the superior labrum, it is a tendon that intra-articularly has an inferior inclination along the rotator interval before turning south, exiting the joint through the bicipital groove that is stabilized in its proximal uh, part by the biceps pulley and the transverse humeral ligament. So the biceps has a lot of anatomical variants regarding its origin and intra-articular shape that the surgeon should be uh, used to, but I won't go into great detail. I will tell you that regarding the anatomy, we should divide the proximal biceps essentially in two parts. So you have this first part that is intra-articular and the second part that is extra-articular. And the, if we look at this second part, we should divide it in three zones. So we have the zone one with the bicipital groove, and this zone one reaches until the inferior border of the subscap. We have the zone two that is situated between the inferior border of the subscap and the superior margin of the pec major tendon. And we have the third zone underneath the pec major. So though these anatomical aspects matter, yes, they matter and we should be uh, familiar with them because when we are thinking especially regarding the extra articular part, because intra-articular, we can see the biceps very well in our surgical field, but regarding the extra articular part, we should know that standard diagnostic arthroscopy, even during doing a pull-up test, we are only able to see around 80% of the biceps until the end of the subscapularis. But if we think until the end of the zone two, so above the superior border of the pec major, we are only able to see around 55% of the long head of the biceps with studies showing that in chronically symptomatic patients, around 50% of the injuries are not seen even when we do very thorough uh, debridement and uh, cleaning of our biceps tendon. Regarding its function, the role of the long head of the biceps keeps being controversial. We know from our French colleagues that it is a known cause of pain, and it is a known cause of pain that improves when the biceps is absent. So patients with spontaneous some spontaneous or surgical tenotomies improve their pain. We also know that patients with this kind of procedure, if it is a tenotomy or with a spontaneous rupture, usually do well. So patients that have proximal injuries to the proximal tear of the 
long head of the biceps are not very painful. And for a few years, we look at the biceps as a useless structure. But right now, we still don't know it's the magnitude of its functional role, but there is increasing evidence that it can have some kind of function, but there is a great uh, interest and a robust evidence that he, it has a therapeutic po uh, potential with the long head of the bicep, biceps being used for all kinds of procedures like the labroplasty and the DASH procedure for instability for augmentation in cuff repair or even as a possible graft for superior capsule reconstruction. Regarding its function, it is described as having a role in the proprioception of the shoulder. This is more or less uh, consensual that it can have some kind of sensitivity role. Regarding its function, it is described that patients with uh, absence or injuries, complete injury to the long head of the biceps can have some lack of strength in elbow flexion, but especially in elbow supination strength. It was described as being important in shoulder abduction when the shoulder is in external rotation, but this is some kind of controversial because EMG studies show that there is not a lot of activity in the long head of the biceps during his isolated shoulder motion when the elbow and the forearm are in fixed positions. He has been described as having a role as a humeral depressor. It was theorized by Neer early on that this tendon could be, could have a role as a depressor of the humeral head. It was posteriorly described by other authors that when the proximal tendon, proximal biceps tendon is released, there is superior migration of the humeral head. So this was described, but we'll see some of the problems with these studies in a few slides. As a stabilizer, it was initially postulated that the lesions of the pulley system and instability of the lung head of the biceps can have a role in allowing anterior translation and upward migration of the humeral head. And also that we see some kind of increased instability, increased activity of the long head of the biceps and the biceps muscle when we have anterior instability. So this was seen as a possible role for the long head of, long head of the biceps as a glenohumeral humeral stabilizer. But there are significant limitations with most of these studies because most of them are biomechanical. And what we see in these biomechanical studies are two things. One, we cannot isolate the role of the long head of the biceps from the other muscles and tendons. So we really don't know if this stabilizing function is related with the biceps or with some kind of other tendon. And many of these studies show that this role, both as a depressor or stabilizer, is when we have the long, long head of the biceps tensioned. And this is not really supported by our physiological movement, because what we see when we are having physiological movement of the shoulder is that there is really no big activation in the electromyographical studies regarding the long head of the biceps. So all in all, I would say that we still don't know very well which kind of role the long head of, of, long head of the biceps has regarding its function. We have this very nice study published, published in 2012 in the American Journal of Sports Medicine by GPART, where he compared two kinds of patients. So we studied two kinds of situations in the same patients. He had a group of patients that underwent, underwent subpectral tenodesis, and he compared the shoulder that was operated with the normal shoulder. And what we saw under dynamic maneuvers in fluoroscopy is that the average difference in translation was less than one millimeter, which, which led him to the conclusion uh, that the biceps tenodesis and in consequence, in, in consequence, the intact uh, insertion of the biceps or the interrupted insertion of the biceps has little effect on glenerohumeral humeral kinematics. 
So regarding the biceps pathology and its etiology, we can look at this at least from all these points of view. It can be either inflammatory, degenerative, mechanical related, traumatic or instability and sports related. We must take in consideration that this division is a little bit artificial because many times these etiologies can coexist. And also many of the times that we saw these injuries coming, causing pain, the patients also have another inter injuries, both in cuff and or uh, lab labrum that can also contribute to the pain. So regarding the inflammatory pathology, the biceps tendinitis, it can be isolated. It is very, it is more rare to see it isolated. It accounts for about 5% of the cases and we can have inflammation both in the tendon or in the tendon sheet where we have a tenosynovitis. There is, it was described by Pascal Boulos, some kind of inflammatory process that causes the hourglass biceps. This was described to have, to, have, to result from an irritated and inflamed tendon that becomes thickened in its an intra-articular portion or segment of the tendon. This is a significant pathology, an important alteration that we must uh, acknowledge and look for because this thick tendon can block the excursion of the tendon to its groove during shoulder motion. So patients can present to us with a mechanical lock, lock with loss of forward flexion. And even under anesthesia, we can see that patients with Howard Glass biceps have a static limitation to its forward flexion. Moreover, the thickened portion of the tendon during its movement inside the intraarticular part can re disrupt the stabilizing structures with, of the rotator interval with biceps instability and increased uh, injuries to other structures. But, but most of the inflammatory uh, problems reg regarding the biceps are associated with cuff pathology. So when we look either to the studies that look at the biceps pathology, so patients with chronic degenerative changes, as in this study with from Westermark in 2018, where he went to see in patients with problems in the biceps, how many of the patients had cuff pathology and up to 90% have concomitant pathology. But when we look from the other way around, for patients with rotator cuff pathology, we have this very nice study by Chen in 2005, where he found in complete rotator cuff, about, around 75% of the patients have associated injuries to the biceps. So patients with biceps pathology, up to 90% have rotator cuff pathology, and patients with rotator cuff pathology, up to 75% of them can have biceps pathology and the risk for and the intensity the severity of the disease is greater with the severity of the cuff disease so tears that are greater with that are greater than five centimeters have more advanced biceps pathology than inferior tears when we look for the biomechanical studies and the anatomic studies, the evidence is a little bit more controversy. So I found these two studies, both from 2005, both in cadavers, one from Toshiaki, where he found in 14 cadavers that biceps pathology and hypertrophy was associated with rotator cuff tears. But in the same year, Carpenter in the same number of cadavers, he didn't find any kind of relations between the biceps pathology and the cuff tear. So I would say that from a clinical stand point of view, what we are used to see that these pathologies come hand to hand. So when we are operating a patient to a cuff injury, we should make a thorough evaluation of the biceps and same wise in the opposite direction when we are addressing a patient with a biceps symptom and the biceps, biceps pathology, we must uh, evaluate thoroughly the rest of the cuff. Another situation is the degenerative cuff pathology. So as tendinitis progresses, we start to having some fraying 
of the biceps tendon it's what we see in our older patients this is a secondary deterioration of the biceps that when it has some time some years of evaluation it lacks a true inflammatory component and what we see from the histological point of view is that there, there are, we verify atrophy from the collagen fibers fissuring from the tendon fibromyalgia necrosis and fibrocyte proliferation. So this is the typical degenerative condition and very frequent. Then we can have mechanical problems leading to biceps pathology. And then this can occur in by several uh, reasons. So we can have biceps irritation and uh, symptoms and alterations that come from its impingement against the coracochromial arc. This is some kind of impingement where the repetitive wear le leads to inflammation of the tissue and tissue deterioration with either tendinitis or subluxation of the tendon. We can have some trauma to the bicepital groove that like microfractures, repeated motions, rare, but it can happen, uh, fractures from the bicepital groove that can cause synovitis that lead to attrition and stenosis of the tendon in the groove. So we have a mechanical injury that is induced by an alteration in the place where the tendon is going through, but we can also have anatomical variations where shallow, oblique or narrow grooves lead to a uh, not physiological um, gliding of the tendon that can cause both tendinitis or instability. We can also have in our transition from zone two, so the superior part of the pec major to zone three, the tendon underneath the pec major, some kind of stenosis. This is a anatomical region where the pec major insertion forms um, bottlenecks for many injuries. So we can have loose, body, loose bodies, synovitis that migrate through zone one and two extra articular, but become um, stuck in this bottleneck caused by the proximal uh, pectoralis major. And this can be also be a reason for mechanical injury to the long head of the biceps. Then, regarding traumatic or instability reasons, we know that uh, lesions, isolated lesions from the biceps pulley that lead to instability are rare but can occur. Most are described with fault with the arm with internal rot rotation that comes that causes an injury to the pulley, and so this causes some kinds of biceps dislocation above the subscap, and the patients can complain, complain about mechanical symptoms like popping and clicking with the range of motion. Most of the instability uh, injuries to the long head of the biceps are related to other pathologies. So we already talked about the internal intrasuperior impeachment can, can lead in the long term to uh, lesion of the pulley and instability of the tendon, but we can also see it together with cuff injuries, especially subscapularis injuries. And regarding the sub, the cuff injuries, both Abermeyer and Lafosse uh, published series where a significant uh, proportion of patients, 65 to 90 percent of the patients that undergone arth arthroscopic treatment for cuff tears, presented instability with some kind of subluxation of the long head of the biceps. And this is very important that when we are performing arthroscopic cuff repair, especially in the subscapularis, we will see some kind of fraying, but we must clean this fraying, we must put the arm in internal, internal rotation and then test if the biceps is truly stable or if there is any kind of instability that should be addressed both in the cuff and in the biceps. So regarding the traumatic causes, ruptures of the long head of the biceps are more common by degenerative reasons, but they can also cause, be occurred by traumatic mechanisms. Both occur along the articular margin around 2.5 centimeters from the origin, where, where we see that there is a vascular watershed region 
same wise as we see more or less in the Achilles tendon. There are other entities described. I never saw one, but we can have from trauma, long half of, of the biceps incarceration. So this is an injury where the biceps becomes stuck between the glenoid and the humeral, but underneath the head. So this would be an in, a true incarceration of the long head of the biceps. And finally, where we, are, we have the sports related pathology. So when we talk about uh, sports related biceps pathology, we are speaking about the slap lesion, especially the type two and the type four injuries. These are the injuries that affect the stability of the insertion of the proximal part of the long head of the biceps in the supraglenoid uh, tubercle. They are most commonly found in younger and sporting populations, especially in throwing athletes, gymnastics, swimmers, or patients participating in contact sports. Related slap, there is some controversy in the reason that causes the slap. So we can have slap caused by a traumatic effect. So the, a fall with the arm in the outstretched position that is predicted to cause a slap tear. It, there is a lot of interest in the forces of acceleration and deceleration, torsion and shearing, especially in the patients that do a lot of throwing movements like handball, volleyball, baseball players. And when this force is coupled with forced flexion, in the elbow with forearm supination, this could be a cause for a rupture of the proximal insertion of the biceps. Independent of the, of the fact that the biceps is put to distress, what more actually is being described is that the slap is resulting primarily from the superior migration of the humeral head regarding the glenoid more than related to this biceps, increased biceps tension uh, accoupled or that comes together with the movement. Regarding diagnosis, starting with the clinical, typically patients with biceps pathology present with pain. So they have pain at rest, they can have pain at night, but especially they have pain with motion and rotation of the shoulder. This can be mainly this. Uh, described to occurring in the anterior part of the shoulder, close to the bicepital groove. It can also radiate to the muscle belly. So we see that this is not a very specific symptom. It is what we see usually in our consultations in patients that come to us with shoulder pain. In physical, physical examination, they can have more tenderness in the lesser tuberosity. And it is a good maneuver to try to do comparative palpation of the bicepital groove, telling the patients to put their shoulders in a slight internal rotation. In cases of dislocation, sometimes we can feel the pop and we can feel the long head of the biceps being rolled under the finger. But besides this, we have a lot of provocative or specific tests like the Jaegers and the Speed, the O'Brien, whatever. There are a lot of tests, but none of these tests is specific enough in isolation to confirm the diagnosis of uh, the long head of, of the biceps or its insertion in the superior labrum. So my advice would be to do a thorough clinical uh, uh, clinical story and physical examination and based on this, do some kind of imagiological exams. Regarding our imaging diagnosis, the plain x-ray is very limited, except if we see some kind of calcification or osteophyte in the bicepital groove. The ultrasound, it has a controversial sensitivity. So many studies describing it as having a poor sensitivity, others describing it as being a very sensitive exam. It is a highly specific exam when we see some kind of alteration in the ultrasound, it is very operator dependent. So it is more or less consensual to say it is poor for diagnosing intra-articular pathology, but, but very good in evaluating uh, uh, biceps instability. So the MRI is the most widely the method of imaging for the rotator cuff, but also for the biceps. There are a lot of a sign that we should look for and know 
we can see some displacement of the lung head of the biceps uh, regarding the subscap. We can see medial subluxation. There, there can be some discontinuity, both in the tendon in its integrity or in its insertion in the superior glenoid. But for the standard MRI, we should take it notice that there is not a very strong agreement between what we see in the MRI and then what we find intraoperatively. So the MRI doing it in a normal fashion can somehow underdiagnose some of the uh, some of the pathologies from the long head of the biceps. If we do some MRI with contrast, the arthro MRI, it is a preferable method for detecting, <clears throat> sorry, detecting injuries for the, uh, the biceps, the pulley system and slap lesions with the literature saying it has a high sensitivity and a high specificity regarding the diagnosis of these injuries. When we look at treatment, of course, the non-operative treatment is the first line of treatment as for most of uh, our diseases that we treat. So start with rest, uh, activity modification, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, sometimes immobilization, physical therapy, but take notice that there is limited research showing the true outcomes and impact that physical therapy has regarding uh, pathology from the long head of the biceps. Uh, injections, a combination of corticosteroid and local anesthetic can be of diagnostic and therapeutical value. value. We should take great care to inject the tendon sheet or the groove and try not to inject the tendon as there is a risk for biceps tendon ruptures and the patients should be advised for this. So taking this in consideration, it is advisable to use ultrasound to improve the accuracy of the injection. With the ultrasound, we can see some of the difficulties that there is doing the injection regarding adhesions or synovitis in the, in the groove. When the injections work, they are a therapeutical test and they can, when they improve the patient's symptoms, they show that the cause of pain was in the pain, in the site of the injection. So this is also important for not only treatment, but diagnosis. And following the injection, the patient should be adv advised to have for at least one or two weeks, weeks uh, some kind of activity uh, restriction. Regarding the operative treatment, <clears throat> It is indicated in the patients that, that fail the conservative treatment. There are a lot of options described. This debridement, slap repair was initially uh, described. We'll speak about it, tenotomy or tenodesis. And the option depends on the kind of injury that we have, but especially in the kind of patient that we have. So patients with different ages, different uh, activity or athletical levels, patients with different goals can have different kinds or should have different different kinds of treatment. So regarding the debridement, we should use it in essentially two groups of patients. So patients with grade one or grade two tendon uh, fraying. So patients that have less than 50% of tendon fraying that are symptomatic after conservative treatment can undergo debridement. For patients with greater fraying, uh, we shouldn't do the debridement. If the patient is symptomatic, we should do a, tenot a tenotomy or the tenodesis. And for slap type 3 patients that present a buckle, buckle handle tear of the superior labrum that ex extends to the biceps, but where the long head of the biceps attachment remains in intact, we can perform isolated resection of this bucket handle and the writement of the, ten of the tendon with no further need for stabilization. Regarding slap repair, this was uh, when I was a young resident, it was a hot subject, so everyone was doing slap repairs. But right now what we see is there is a growing trend to move away from slap repair due to increased incidence of 
subsequent revision surgery, and there is an increased tendency to perform biceps tenodesis because patients usually do better. So if we look at the trends in the last 10 years regarding isolated slap lesion, the slap repairs have decreased from 70 to around 40%, and the biceps, isolated biceps tenodesis for slap injury has increased from 20% in, in an order of 300, 300 of, of 370%. The same tend tendency to address uh, slap injuries together with rotator cuff repair with the tendency of the slap repair coming down and the trends in biceps tenodesis or tenotomy going up. So regarding the slap repair, especially for type 2 patients, the problem as reported with Said, he had this very big number of patients, more than 500 patients with slap to tear that underwent repair. The patients reported excellent satisfaction, around 80% of them returning, 80% uh, of them being very set, uh, satisfied with the, with the procedure, but only 70% of them went on to have to perform the same kind of sports. So if we are talking about uh, professional athletes or active patients doing sport, we are looking at the 30% failure to uh, ad in addressing the slap tear by this technique. In the same sample, if we, look, if we look at the 200 overhead athletes, the percentage of patients that were able to return the previous level of uh, activity is around 60%, so 40% of failure. And this study is repeated in the literature with overhead athletes that undergone slap repair only return to the pre-injury level of sports activity in rates that are from 20%, which is catastrophic, up to 85%. But even for 85%, when we, we have a technique with 15% failure in a professional athlete, this can be, this should be a cause of concern. So Valo, for instance, when he compared patients that underwent slap, uh, patients with slap, uh, two, slap two injury, a group that underwent repair and the group that underwent uh, tenodesis, the slap repair group had inferior outcomes with lower constant score, lower satisfaction and a lower return to sports in the previous level. Patrick Denard in patients over 35 years also with slap to tear that went both arthroscopic repair or tenodesis reported in the tenodesis group a shorter postoperative uh, recovery with higher satisfaction rates and the higher returns to its normal sports. Heck uh, reported that as Dinard and Boileau that patients that when they underwent and when they undergo repair or tenodesis though they both present a good clinical outcomes with similar rates in this study of returns to sports, but he reported also that patients with tenodesis have higher constant scores, higher satisfaction rates, and higher returns to sports at its pre-lesion level. So all in all, there is this big tendency to not repair the slab, but to tenodize it. Regarding the tenotomy, this is a very uh, popular technique. There, is, there are some concerns regarding the Popeye sign that occurs in less than 40% of the patients that do surgical tenotomies. So patients that undergo tenotomy have less Popeye sign than patients that have sp spontaneous ruptures. And this can be caused because some kind of hypertrophy in the proximal segment of the biceps, some kinds of adhesions, some kinds of stenosis in the groove can be used as an autotenodesis. It is described for tenotomy as it was for spont spontaneous, spontaneous ruptures, some diminished force regarding the forearm supination and elbow flexion, but this is a technique that can be considered and that I consider in my daily practice for elderly patients with low functional demands. There are no significant complications, but take in consideration that when we are performing a tenotomy, there is no benefit doing concomitant acromioplasty because 
not not only this doesn't improve the results, it can be detrimental because if we cut the corochromical the uh, C ligament, the corochromial ligament, we can have in this case some instability of the humeral head. Regarding tenodesis, they are becoming more popular with our increased operative experience. There is this. Uh, increased tendency to do an anatomic fixation along the tendon anatomical pathway. I'll speak about this in the next slides. We can do it both arthroscopically or open. There are multiple fixation methods with new techniques and implants and also multiple places for tenodesis. Regarding tenodesis, to speak briefly around some pitfalls. So never do uh, tenodesis in the groove and leave the tendon attached to the glenoid. This can result in an iatrogenic entrapment of the long head of the biceps with increased uh, pain for the patients. Even if you want to do some kind of reconstruction of the superior cable or superior capsule reconstruction with the long head of the biceps, we should keep it um, intact in the glenoid, fix it in the humerus, but then do a separated tenodesis so we don't have this kind of entrapment of the biceps. The non-anatomical tenodesis that were described for multiple places should be avoided as they cause dysfunction of the shoulder and pain. So soft tissue tenodesis to the rotator interval is frequently associated with subluxation, uh, thickened and scar tissue to the rotator interval, and this can cause pain and increased injuries to the patient. The tenodesis to the coracoid or the process or the conjoint, process or conjoint tendon changes the course in the tendon, and it can cause pain by traction and the disease under the insertion of the pec major. And even the tenodesis that it's done to the pec pectoralis major tendon it is very simple, very simple, but can also cause pain by a cross pull of the tendon. For instance, I only use the tenodesis to the pec major tendon when I'm doing the addressing the biceps in patients undergoing shoulder arthroplasty. So, regarding the way to do the tenodesis, as I told you, it can be done by multiple ways. So regarding the controversy of open versus arthroscopic, there are pros and cons and pros and cons to both techniques. The open uh, approach has a lower cost. There are no differences between the uh, clinical exams with functional outcomes or range of motion. The complications are the usual with a uh, with an open procedure as there are complications with arthroscopic procedure, there is no kind of consensus over which method it's superior. I think the advisable it is to do what you do best and with what you are more experienced in doing and especially try to adapt your technique, either open or arthroscopic, to the kind of uh, injury or lesion that the patient presents. Regarding the fixation strategies, we can fix it 90 degrees inside the bone in an inlay technique fixation, or we can only do the tenodesis by fixing the uh, tendon parallel to the bone in an onlay technique. We can use different implants, titanium peak bio uh, reabsorbable or suture anchors, anchors. There are no consensus among the ideal fixation technique when we look at biomechanical studies, so we can have studies advoking for one technique or implant and a different study advoking for the, the exact, uh, the, the, the opposed technique. But what is consensual is that there are no clinical differences in outcomes. So here also we should use what we feel more comfortable and it's more adapted to our patients. Regarding the tenodesis placement, here we can see some kind of differences. We can fix the tendon intra-articular intra -articular or extra-articular, either in a supra-pectoral position in the bicipital groove or in a sub-pectoral position. So 
the problems with the intraarticular fixation that we usually do when we do concomitant or simultaneous cuff repair is that can there can be some persistent bicipital groove pain. And there are some portions, as I told you in the first slides, there are some portions of the tendon that we do not we do not see and where we can leave some kind of uh, remainant pathology that is below the place of the tenothesis, and this can be a cause of persisting pain. When we do it suprapectoral, it is a nice technique because we can do it in an arthroscopic fashion. It avoids the inflammation from the remaining tendon that is inside the bicipital groove. It takes longer time, it has higher costs, and the place where we are fixing the tendon has a thinner bone stock for hardware fixation. And because we are still in the groove, some studies also describe that there is some residual pain. Regarding the subpectral tenodesis, though so there is no pain created, created from the reattachment within the groove, there is no residual uh, hidden pathology because we are making the, uh, the tenodesis in the muscular tendinous junction. We have a strong bone for fixation in the humerus that potentially can lead to a quicker recovery, but this is an open technique. So if we do a sub tenodesis, and I do it in some cases, it's always uh, mandatory to do the arthroscopic part together and then the open procedure. Regarding the tenodesis placements, all three approaches have excellent and similar clinical outcomes. So here also we should choose what we are more comfortable or better said, more adapted to the needs of the patient that we have in front of us. Finally, the controversy regarding tenotomy versus tenodesis. So recent systematic reviews and meta-analysis confirm that there is no evidence-based difference in between tenodesis and tenotomy regarding shoulder function, pain, or biceps related, related strength. But I think we there are these are recent studies, but we should take this absence of difference with some caution. For sure, biceps tenotomy is a safe and a good technique, but this doesn't mean that, that we don't see in the long term major differences that we should start in doing tenotomies for all the patients in a sudden fashion. So as a take home message, I would say that the longer head of the bicep, biceps is increasingly recognized as an important cause, and cause of shoulder pain and, and dysfunction. Its functional role is still not completely understood. There is some role, but our present evidence points that it looks to be limited. The diagnosis should be done both clinically and radiological because we cannot have a def definitive diagnosis with only of only one of the dimensions. That retaining a pathological tendon probably has a more negative functional consequence than the loss of the tendon itself. And regarding um, surgical treatment, there are decreased indications to perform slap repair. Biceps tenotomy and tenodesis are the best options for surgical treatment of the long head of the biceps. And regarding the tenodesis, we have different options between arthroscopic open techniques, different methods and techniques of fixations and place for tenodesis with no significant functional differences uh, in the long term. So thank you and for your time and I'm open for your questions. And I apologize for taking a little bit longer. Thank you, Manuel. <laughs> uh, Manuel, you can stop sharing actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah, done. Uh, th thank you, Manuel, for this very comprehensive presentation. A uh, few questions, Manuel. Now, how often do you do an ultrasound guided injection for a proximal bicep tendonitis? <clears throat> So this is an excellent question. When I have patients with, I only do it for patients with tenosynovitis that are resistant for conservative treatment with uh, non-steroid uh, systemic and local anti-inflammatory drugs and that are resistant to rehab. And when I indicate these patients for infiltration of the tendon sheet, I never do it myself. 
So this is the kind of patient that I send it to a radiologist, but because I truly don't find it safe to do it by myself. And do you think uh, PRP <laughs> has an advantage in such a situation? Excellent question. So the PRPs are the new kid on the block. We are all um, subject to a lot of pressure, industry driven pressure. There is there are a lot of uh, papers coming for the time being and relate uh, related to uh, tendinitis. I don't use I don't use PRPs in my patients. I think the biological treatments for sure have an important role, and they will be the treatment of the future. And there are some indications where we can use biological solutions, probably more attractive to partial cuff tears. But for an inflammatory condition, I don't find it very advisable because the biological solutions. Some of them are described to have a pro-inflammatory reaction, so these patients can become worse. And when you have a patient that has a fraying of the tendon, it won't go away. When you have a slap tear, it won't heal. When you have a mechanical impingement, it won't resolve. So infiltrations, the good indication for me with local anesthetic and corticosteroids, ultrasound guided for inflammatory uh, causes. Thank you, Manuel, for that. Uh, Manuel, you also joined by Loy. Loy Al Khatib is an orthopedic and sports medicine surgeon based in Dubai. Uh, Loy, your questions to Manuel, please. Loy, you need to un unmute, please, first. Sure. Yeah. Hi. Good, e good evening, guys. Thanks, Manuel, for the presentation. Interesting topic. I think we have uh, a lot of complicated questions and no simple answers. Mm -hmm. I agree. The anterior, anterior shoulder pain is uh, the mastery. So one of the common causes, maybe one of oh, the common causes is uh, proximal biceps pathology. To diagnose the, the pathology, you need to do to take, as you said, a good clinical uh, history and do a physical exam. The challenge in the physical exam itself, as you say, speech tests, the Augustine's test, um, O'Brien tests, all of these tests are like they are non-specific tests. Unfortunately, these tests, uh, they reach about 50% specificity, not more. But one, one of the tests, maybe you can talk about it, O'Driscoll test. If you combine these tests all together, the dynamic, uh, the dynamic compressive test for the, for the biceps, proximal biceps test, you might reach up to 70, 70, 80%. This is not, that's not my question. My question is, would you have all, if you, if you review all the studies, they try to answer two questions. The first question, where to fix the biceps syndrome? The second question is, what method is to be used to fix it? Is it inlay, onlay, onlay, cortical button, all suture, peak, or name it? Do you think we have an answer for these questions? So that, 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 that truly is the... the, the... The great, the great question. Question: When um, Professor Gopalan made me this challenge, I went to see the latest things that have been published. There are always coming new things, and when we, when you do a more comprehensive review, what you see is there are no definite, definitive answers. So let's do it by parts. Personally, I don't have a unique method of fixation regarding technique or place. I think that we should use a patient-tailored uh, approach because what the results tell us is that for sure no one is using right now uh, metallic answers. The bioabsorbable have some kind of problems that are have been published. So, but if we need to choose between inlay and unlay, there are no differences clinically. Uh, when you need to choose between screws, extracortical fixation, or soft tissue, there are contradictory evidence regarding the biomechanical studies, and they are all the same regarding the, the clinical studies. What we must is put together this information and try to tailor it to the patients. I will give you what I my uh, summarized algorithm. 
it is very rare for me to leave the biceps in place. So if I do a cuff for a patient that is over 70 years old, and that these are not very common indications, I will do just a tenotomy, okay? If I'm doing it to a younger patient, female, that is very fat, I will do a tenotomy resecting the superior part of the labrum. This can give you some kind of um, biological tenodesis in the upper part of the groove and the patients, because they are more fat, they don't complain regarding the Popeye and they are not very physical demanding. When I'm dealing with younger patients, usually what I do for superior cuff is I do the repair intra-articular together with the cuff repair, okay? If I have a patient that has a more retracted um, cuff tear that I need to reconstruct the cable, I use the proximal biceps to make an augmentation in the cuff. So I cut the biceps and I suture it in to reconstruct the anterior cable. And I do the tenodesis uh, in the, in the bicepital groove. But for instances, when, for instance, when I'm operating on athletes, demanding patients that have a slap tear, or slap with tenosynovitis, what I prefer to do is I do the arthroscopic procedures that just to cut the biceps and I do uh, inlay technique with um, a subpectral tenodesis. So my more, in my hands, the more reproducible tenodesis regarding pain and speed of um, rehabilitation is the subpectral tenodesis. It gives me confidence to put it with an extracortical fixation and a screw inside the bone. It is very easy to do the tensioning of the tendon. There are some concerns with let, letting the biceps loose or over tensioning the biceps, but in there we have an anatomic landmark, but I don't do it for all my patients to be very honest with you because it is more time consuming, more demanding. I don't, I don't think there is a benefit for our, uh, opening the sub pack in all the cuff repairs that I do. So if I have a normal cuff, I do the intraarticular tenodesis in the upper part of the groove or oh, extraarticular yeah. in the, yeah, in the extraarticular in the upper part of the, of the groove. If I have isolated patient, isolated biceps, I will go with a sub pack, but the present literature, there is a lot of literature we see some kind of report saying that the patients with subpectral tenodesis in re, uh, rehab in a speedier fashion, but there is no uh, def definitive evidence telling you you should do this or you should do that. I think it should be patient-driven. Yeah. Uh, I do agree. Back to the ultrasound-guided injection, maybe one, two, mm -hmm. plus, one last comment on that. If you... One of the studies compared blind injection versus ultrasound guided injection. Patients who had ultrasound guided injection, they were had reported 90% improvement in their symptoms. Why? The other the patients that had the same pathology, let's say, say by biceps tendinitis, they reported around 37 uh, improvement. This is something to take into consideration. When you consider injecting a biceps, it's worth to do it uh, ultrasound guided. Yeah, if you have someone that can, this is a for me a structural principle in my orthopedic, in my medical practice. So if you have someone that can see it better, do it better. If you cannot do better blinded, then the radiologist can do it by looking at it, you shouldn't do it. The evidence shows that ultrasound injections are more precise because you see where you put the needle. And if the patient has an adhesion or an osteophyte in the groove, you can avoid that place and you inject where you want to inject the amount that you want to inject. So when you have like difficulties doing the injection, we just don't change place in a blind way and try to put it anyway. And I told you in my presentation, this is a problem with injections because if we do corticosteroids injections in the groove and we go inside 
the tendon, this is the true risk for tendon rupture. And the worst rupture. thing is that we are trying to treat a patient in a conservative way and we do an iatrogenic injury. So this is something that we should avoid. I will tell you, right now, I don't do, I, I send it to the radiologist that work with us to do this kind of injections together with the uh, AC injections for uh, chromoclavicular arthritis, for the calcifying tendinitis. If they see it better, they do ultrasounds better than we surgeons. We shouldn't be doing it. Uh, that's true. They they all they use also doublex ultrasound actually. Uh, they can see the blood vessels and they uh, will be more oriented than us. Uh, that's true. One last question is: Would you, if you have a tough trip, as you say that uh, 70, 75 percent of the tough tears they come with a long biceps head pathology? Mm -hmm. Would you address the Would you address the long head of the biceps first, and you go to the cuff? Or would you repair the cuff first, then do your tenotomy or tenodesis? What do you think? Great question. So again, what is easier for me? If I have, for instance, subscap retracted tear, where you have the biceps dislocated uh, to the place where you need to repair the subscap, because when you have uh, complete tear of the subscap with the retraction, the biceps become more, more medial and medial. I address the biceps first, either in the groove or uh, I do a subpectral tenodesis, but for sure address the biceps first. If I have, let's say, a grade two Lafos uh, subscap uh, injury with a superior uh, supraspinatus and infraspinatus tear, I will deal with the subscap initially, then I go to the subacromial space, I do all the prepping, put the anchors in place, and then I start by doing the tenodesis in theory, cut the biceps, and afterwards I do the cut repair. So it really depends. It's what's easier and faster for me to do. Ah, okay. Thanks a lot. I think that's um, that's it, uh, Hedish. Okay. You still have uh, more questions? Thank you, Loy. Uh, thank you, Manuel, uh, for this very comprehensive presentation. And uh, I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people. And uh, we we'll look forward for another presentation from you in future as well. Thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure, a pleasure for me to be here with you guys. Thank you.